So good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. For those of you who don't know me, I just wanted to formally introduce myself. Um, so my name is Julie Johnson. I'm a photographer here in Burlington. And uh, I wanted to introduce my family to you. So on the screen up here, you are going to see my husband. His name is Norman. Never thought I'd marry a Norman, ladies. And um, second, uh, we have three children together. Jacob, who is my only son. He's nine years old. Um, Madison, who is 10. And Jessica, who is 11, turning 12 next month. Lots of fun. Okay. So, as a photographer, I spend a lot of time with my clients. Some sessions are over two hours long, so you can imagine how intimate and personal the conversations can become. I've learned over the years that everyone has a story. Today, I'm going to share with you mine. My mother, Lynn, who is right over here, this beautiful woman in the blue dress, is, um, wrote me a love letter recently, and it was one of the most beautiful, heartfelt letters I've ever read. I cried throughout all six pages. Today, during our time together, you're going to hear her reading portions from her letter, which express how she was feeling during, during the difficult stages of my life. So here she is. Here she is. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, is she on? Hello? Yep. Yes? Okay. Oh, great. Uh, dear Julie, as I write this letter, I have tears in my eyes as I remember back in time to when you were my baby. I wanted to take the time to write to you and express the love that I have for you. I remember when you were born. I was so excited when you took your first breath and delighted that I could hear your first cry. How beautiful you were with your full head of fine hair. You were as precious then as you are today. Thanks, Mom. The first time I held you, you were cuddly and enjoyed the safety of my arms. As time went on, you came to know and trust me. And as you grew, I was there for you for every special occasion, and I recorded all those events in my heart. So I was born right here in Burlington, and I'm the middle of three girls. If you look up at your screen, you can guess which one I am, the one with the curly hair on the far left. <laughs> and Lori, my older sister, is in the middle, and my younger sister, Leslie, is to the right. Oh, okay. okay, Mom, you're coming back <laughs> up again. You weren't supposed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, she told me, get out of the limelight when it's my turn. <laughs> I did not. I did not. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You were just five years old when tragedy struck our family. The man I loved with all my heart and thought I would spend the rest of my life with gave his heart to another woman. This was the first time that you realized that things are not always as they seem, and life can be tough. You suffered terribly and missed your father and longed to be with him and have his undivided love and attention. I remember clearly the day my father left. I watched him pack box after box into his blue Mustang. As he pulled away, I remember running up to my parents' bedroom and find my mom crying on the base of their bed. With tears flowing, my sisters and I began hugging her from every direction. Within five years, both my parents ended up remarried and having more children with their new spouses. As I became older, I started to make certain observations about our new family dynamics. I recall going over to my dad's and seeing pictures of him with his new family. My mom and her husband and new baby would go on exotic trips together and leave the three of us at home. Where did we fit in? Where did we belong? And where was our family? Without knowing that I had a heavenly father that I could turn to for comfort, I became hurt and angry. In my 14th year, my dad became a born-again Christian. He would be so excited to talk about Jesus and the Bible all the time. And I was drawn to listen to him when he would talk about the end times. I would find it fascinating. As a team, I as a teen, sorry, I invested everything into my friends and my social life. I became very selfish, shallow, and more and more disrespectful. I would smoke in my bedroom, steal alcohol. I took my dad's car for a joy ride underage and without a license, and let's not forget without permission. I would stay out late at parties and would not call to say when I'd be home. I used foul language and was very hard to manage. My mother had enough, and at the age of 15, I was kicked out of the home. Here she comes, <laughs> Miss America. 
<laughs> then came the teen years, and the rebellion set in. You took charge of your life, and you wanted to sort things out for yourself. You thought I was too old, and I knew nothing. You didn't want to be seen with me in the shopping malls. You got into drugs and hung out with a bad crowd. I tried my best to steer you in the right direction, but your will was too strong. My heart was broken. I could only watch. I could only cry. I felt helpless, but I had to let you go on your own to learn your lessons, perhaps the hard way. At 17, my dad was persistent in having my sisters and I attend a Christian play. It was called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I learned that night that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. At the end of the play, they had an altar call for anyone feeling a tug on their heart to ask Jesus into their life. Weeping, I felt drawn to the front of the church. I realized that I was a sinner in need of a savior. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, asked for forgiveness for my sins, and acknowledged that he died on the cross for me. I felt for a brief moment what I now know was the Holy Spirit enter me. That night, I became a child of God, and my journey with him began. My life did not change instantly. I did not start going to church or scout out any Christian friends. I did not own or read a Bible. With no discipleship training, I ended up in a more downward spiral. I dropped out of high school and then took off on a six-month adventure to British Columbia. The day you left for Vancouver was the saddest day of my life. I cried for weeks and weeks as my heart was broken and I could not be consoled. I talked to my friends. Finally, one of them said to me, Lynn, the child who gives you the most trouble will make you the most proud later in life. I used to say those words to myself over and over, deeply hoping that those words would one day become a reality. This was not how life was supposed to be. I had looked forward to having you bring your boyfriends home, taking pictures of you going to your first prom, enjoying those teen years with you, being there when you graduated with your friends from high school, having your wedding picture taken on the winding staircase. However, I knew that as a mom, I had to stand quietly in the background and watch from a distance. Thanks, Mom. Out west, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. I began to indulge in marijuana daily. I, I was headed for destruction, so without hesitation, I felt led to return back to Ontario and get my life together. God kept putting different Christians in my life who would challenge me to investigate further my walk with Him. I started to think over the years more and more about life, how every human looks completely different. How many different types of noses, eyes, mouths could there possibly be? How each one of us has a unique voice. The earth, how it is floating in the middle of the universe with nothing holding it up. Gravity, how we are perfectly stuck to the earth and the most perfect distance from the sun. My friends said on several occasions that they thought that I should commit myself into an insane asylum because I could not stop analyzing everything and out loud. I remember putting myself in God's shoes, looking down at the world that he created and watching all that was happening. God giving up his one and only son who had no sin. If you look up at the slide, 1 Peter 2.22 states, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He was healing people. And what did the world do? He had been led like a lamb to the slaughter. They had plotted against him saying, let us destroy the tree and its fruits. Let's cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. They tortured and crucified him, his own creation rejecting him time and time again. Looking down at the world, he gives them a book, a love letter, the Bible, that if they live by, they would have love, joy, peace, and so much more. But hearing them say, even the ones that have never opened it, I don't believe the Bible. Giving them the Ten Commandments for their own good, and then watch as every single one of them are broken in the shows they amuse themselves with on TV. Humans drinking, not able to walk or properly walk or talk properly and thinking it was so much fun. I started examining the human body, the universe, how we breathe in oxygen but breathe out carbon dioxide, the food chain. I had questions, how can this all be? I started examining how do I exist? How can nothing become something? 
I realized in my heart that everything in this world has order and there must have been a personal creator and designer of it all. On November 4th, 1994, sitting with a few friends, everything I had been analyzing had come to a head. It was at that moment that I realized that our Heavenly Father was a personal God, that He wants a relationship with His children and with me, and that He has a purpose for us during this life and an internal plan beyond. What a wonderful sense of hope consumed me. Thanks to this deepening revelation, I started laughing as I did not need to analyze anymore. At the same time, I had found this peace. My friends could not understand what was happening to me. I kept saying, don't you guys get it? Like, there is a God. He exists. I was lost, but now was found. I felt God's love so abundantly that I was instantly healed of all my addictions. His love was and is better than any drug I have ever experimented with. That was my first unexpected love, was God's. I finally understood the, so the song, Amazing Grace, as he saved a wretch like me, and I became victorious ladies in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I, called, um, I called my dad, and I told him my discovery and how I was experiencing God. He came and picked me up, and we talked about our Heavenly Father all night. He will never forget when I told him that that Friday night was the best Friday night of my life. I started reading the Bible and could not believe my eyes when I read 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I was a new person. My friends at the time could not understand, and they kept saying to me, I want the old Julie back. And all I kept thinking was, I only wish that I had experienced God sooner. Matthew 11:28 to 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God does not say in his word, come to me when you're perfect, because we never will be. He, um, he wants us to come as we are. If you think that God will never forgive you for the things that you have done, you are wrong. All sin is equal in the eyes of God. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I had a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I was set free. John 8.36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Matthew 7.7. 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone who receives, everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. I asked Jesus to come into my life at that place. Salvation was given to me. I sought after him and I found him. The Bible came alive to me. I couldn't get enough of it. All I wanted to do is read, pray, and talk about how awesome our God is and how he came to my rescue. It has been 16 years and I'm just as excited as the day it happened. I want all my friends to experience God so much that being a new Christian with no wisdom, I would go to the local bars and preach the gospel. It did not go over too well. I was made fun of on several occasions and started to lose more and more of my so-called friends. I went from Miss Popular to Jesus Minion. It hurt, but at the same time, it didn't matter. I was so happy to have Jesus in my life. God had me stop blaming everyone else as justification for my behavior. I became responsible for myself and my reactions. I had hurt so many that I loved. I went and asked them for forgiveness. With regards to dating, I began praying for a future Christian husband. I met Norman, <laughs> love the name, through work and was very attracted to him. In my mind, I said to myself, oh, forget it, he's probably not a Christian. I prayed and pleaded to God, please, Lord. I remember driving and being, please, God, let him be a Christian. It would make me so happy. <laughs> Anyways, a few days later, it came out in conversation that um, Norman was, Jesus transformed his life from anger, rebellion, and turmoil into a new life in Christ several years earlier. I smiled all the way home and kept thanking God. We ended up becoming friends and then started dating about a year later. Both of us knew in our faith, struggled with falling back into our old lives and habits. We both had sexual relationships before we became Christians and battled the temptation of not becoming intimate. It was extremely difficult. Please keep in mind, I was a very evangelical Christian. Everyone knew where I stood. 
At every opportunity, I would share the good news of Jesus Christ. So you can imagine how ashamed I felt when I had to announce to the world that I had become pregnant. You're supposed to go, <gasps> oh, okay, there we go. Our sin, my sin, was exposed for the entire world to see. I had embarrassed God's family and myself. It took me a while to get over my shame, but through Christian counsel, we were able to move forward. I learned that being a Christian does not make you perfect. How often do we hear, what kind of Christian are you? Well, I am a sinner in relationship with a God who is not counting my sins, who forgives me when I mess up, and who can take a bad situation and turn it around and bless me with the most beautiful baby I could ever imagine. We all fall short of the glory of God. Despite my sin, I still felt God's loving arms around me, and he reminded me that he would never leave me nor forsake me. We were married several months later. Throughout the entire pregnancy, God continued to speak to me. He would say, just as you long for your baby to move in you, I long for you to move in me. Ooh. In me, you live and move and have your being is Acts 17, 28. As we were preparing our baby's room and getting everything ready for her arrival, God reminded me that he is preparing a place for his children. In John 14, 3, it says, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. I long to be physically together with my baby, to hold her, to kiss her, and comfort her, to wipe her tears when we brought her home. God is excited for us to be physically with him, where one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Revelation 20, 21, 3 to 4. My eldest sister, Lori, had twins eight weeks before me. She was trying to describe to me this amazing love that she had discovered for her babies. And I said, well, I love them too, Lori. They're my nephews. And she said, no, no, you don't understand. Wait till you have your baby and you will understand this love. Well, let me tell you, the moment I set eyes upon my daughter, I was overwhelmed again with another unexpected love. Every parent that comes into the studio with their newborn baby, I will ask, always ask them, did you ever imagine that you could love someone so much? And no matter what nationality or religious views, they always reply, I had no idea that this love existed. I believe God gave us this love so that, first of all, we wouldn't become extinct. <laughs> and secondly, um, that so we can better understand his love for us. It says in 1 John 3, 1, we love because he first loved us. Some might ask, well, what about mother and mothers and fathers who have abandoned their babies? Where is their love? Well, the Lord says, first of all, that they are evil. We all are evil, and that we all fall short of the glory of God. And secondly, I found the most beautiful verse in Psalm 2710. It states, if your mother or father abandoned you, the Lord will hold you close. I'm not going to share, now I'm going to share with you the top 10 things I now understand since becoming a mother. So can I have a drum roll, please? I'm just kidding, okay. <laughs> I understand my parents and God's love for me. I will never love my, my parents as much as they love me, just as I love my children more than I love my parents. Unfortunately, sorry guys. <laughs> um, I now understand why they never gave up on me. Thank you, Mom, for standing with me today and throughout my life, and Dad for praying for me and leading me to the Lord. Just as my parents desired a relationship with me, even while I was a sinner, so did God. There is nothing in this world that my children could do that could make me love them any more or any less. I understand, number two, so I understand more God's sacrifice of his one and only son. God made it simple for, under, for us to understand how much he loves us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave up his one and only son, that whoever shall, whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Could I sacrifice my only son? Could you? That is how much he loves us. Romans 8, 38 to 39 states, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number three, 
I understand that everything I have belongs to God, as everything that my children have that they think is theirs is in fact mine, and everything I think is mine is in fact God's. We belong to God. In Psalm 50, 12, it says, the world is mine and all that is in it. Number four, God is now not counting our sins. I have yet to find a parent who is documenting everything their child is doing wrong. Number six, mine's six, no, number five. We are all sinners. If you don't think you are a sinner, ask someone that lives with you. They'll fill you in. Okay, number six, I understand that just as my children represent me and my parenting, we as Christians represent the body of Christ. I remember the phrase growing up, now don't embarrass the family. So God doesn't want us to embarrass the family either. We should be trying our best to follow Jesus and represent him as best we can. The world is watching. God created us in his image. In Genesis 1.27, it states, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God designed our offspring to be created in our image. In Genesis 5, 3, so Adam, the first person to ever live, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Well, God blessed me with my firstborn child, and she was given to me in my own likeness. So that's, that's myself on the right and my daughter Jessica on the left, and you can see how similar how similar we were. Number seven, since becoming a mother, I've learned the difference between sheep and goats. Having children in elementary school, we have studied a lot of animals. Did you know that sheep are referred in the Bible over 500 times? More than any other animal. Earlier we talked about how Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and at the final judgment it says that God will separate um, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. With regards to Judgment Day, sheep and goats are used as a metaphor in the Bible. Sheep are often referred to as the followers of Christ, while goats choose not to follow Christ. The parable is based on the differences in behavior between sheep and goats. Sheep are gentle, quiet, innocent animals. They do not give their shepherds a lot of problems. They are easily led, they know their shepherd's voice, and they follow him. Sheep are grazers, unlike the goat, which likes to browse. Goats are rebellious, independent, and hard-headed. Sheep need to stay with the flock for protection. You will never see a sheep on its own, because we know what would happen. I'm sure many of us have seen the effects of the sheep that wander far from the flock. But like the lost sheep, God will never stop pursuing it. Number eight. I understand now why God says, come to me as a child and not a teenager. Matthew 8, 2 to 4. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. God wants his children to be a work in progress, to be humble, to not be as a teenager like I was, thinking I knew it all. He wants us to ask questions, deep thinking ones, to be eager to learn, to figure things out, to go to him for comfort, wisdom, love in times of trouble, and to celebrate with him during times of joy. He wants us to forgive easily, to be thankful for what we have, to be dependent on him for everything, for food, shelter, emotional, mental, and physical needs, to trust in him with all our hearts and to lean not on our own understanding. He wants us to acknowledge him in all our ways, and he will make our path straight. Number nine, I have learned that just as we are protective of our children, God is protective of his children. Matthew 18, five to six says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Need I say more? Number nine, I understand why God wants to be number one in our lives. 
Just recently, I was driving, and a man pulled up beside me, and I wish I had my camera. He had this, uh, this big dangling um, tissue paper, um, like it was a beautiful creation, and on it, it said, number one dad, and he had it there with pride. Imagine how proud this dad feels to know that he is number one in his life. Well, God wants to be number one in your life. Number, oh yeah, okay, so here's where he wants to be number one. So I finally understood the first commandment. So you shall have no other gods besides, before or besides me. And I have expressed to my children, thou shall have no other mother before or besides me. I'm very protective of my children, and I would never want anyone to bond with them the way that I have. I could not imagine my jealousy if they rejected a relationship with me and turned to something or someone else for comfort. Imagine how God is feeling, his creation that he loves so much that he wants so badly to love him and have a relationship with him, reject him, and turn to the other things in this world to love. God is a jealous God, and he wants us all to himself. He has made that very clear by making the number one commandment, you shall have no other gods besides or before me. Number 10, I understand how God loves to be praised by his children. On Mother's Day, I'm sure a lot of us got some really cute cards this morning. All three of my children made me some cute cards. I'm just going to share, share one with you. So it says, Mom, here. And uh, there's a little guy here, and it says, You rock so much, I just can't stop staring. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, I love you. You rock. You are the best mom in the whole wide world. Do you like this card? <laughs> I hope so. I made it for you. It took me a pretty long time to finish this card. Did you read my poems? Which one was your favorite? <laughs> write that here, and then I have a little spot that I can, a little tiny square that I can write which one was my favorite. I made all the poems by myself. I don't have a favorite at all. Uh, do you see the mom on the front of the card? Do you like my picture of the bunny? He thinks you rock too. Happy Mother's Day. And then she goes on to say, Mommy, you're amazing, you're kind, loving, wonderful. I love you, Mommy. And then, I love you, and you love me. You are my mom. I'm your daughter. <laughs> okay. And then this one was, Dear Mom, I love how you cook. How you are so kind to your friends. That's, that's pretty interesting. But I love you the best. Love, Jacob. So God wants to hear our praises. There are so many more biblical parallels with regards to parenting that I could go on forever. So I just want to leave, with, leave you in closing with the following presentation that I put together for you. So God bless you all. Thank you for having me.